In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Today's a beautiful day, and I greet you. Not beautiful in terms of weather. It's blustery outside. It's a beautiful day spiritually. And in the spirit of the day, because of the saint we're celebrating, I owe an apology. For the longest time since I've been at this cathedral, at this temple, I have entered on this side to do my duties. And I've noticed a very fine icon on the wall. It's to St. Siloam. Today, because of being a Sunday and his feast day aligning on a Sunday, at last that icon is here before us. And I've noticed it now fresh and new for the first time. I can actually see his face and I can appreciate him. That's one apology. I have a second apology too. For a number of years, I didn't like St. Siloam. I turned against him, mainly for the most too superficial, topical, idiot reasons. I'll share them with you. God forbid this happens to you. First of all, some people that were really devoted to him and really liked him a lot, I didn't like them. I thought they were awful people, and I judged them hard. Others were extremely devoted to him and even took his name. And I thought his name to be bizarre, unusual sounding to the English trained ear. And for years, I put him off. I had no relics of him. His days came and they went. And that was the end of that. And then recently, as it happens with God, you have a breakthrough. And you have to make a third apology. And you realize all the people that you judged hard were actually pretty good people. I was the bad one. I had fulfilled accidentally something that our church father, Gregory Palamas, says. I would like to relate it to you. He says, if you judge hard, you become hard. If you be judge gently, you become gentle. If you judge someone fat, you become fat. And a lot of Americans have been judging people fat. But if you judge people kindly, you become kind. Because in that judgment, you're receiving something from God. And so that is the element for today. It's interesting that St. Siloam came to me, if you will, through the backyard. And some saints are that way. They don't make grand entrances into our life. They come in through a side door, through the backyard. They don't grace our dining table with tablecloths. Sometimes they come to us and they reach us at a picnic bench. Sometimes they catch us in the unexpected way. For a long time I had made this quote. I had heard it because it's actually an old quote. If you want to save your soul, if you want to save your spiritual life, if you want to save yourself, you have to do this. And it's an unusual expression. Put your mind down into hell. Send your mind into hell and don't despair. Another version of it says, send your mind into hell and send your heart up into heaven. That way the thing that you love, where your treasure is, your heart goes there and feels the warmth and the power of heaven. But your mind, which loves the truth, that's the only thing the mind really likes. Everything else is a distortion. Everything else is a terrible offense to the mind. Hence lies our deep wounds to us both in the heart and in the intellect. Error is something that we don't prize. We do everything in our power to get rid of it. We send our children to the special math tutoring class so that they can get the truth of the math, which is the right answer, because math being what it is, it can't tolerate the wrong answer. It can't be something other than what it is. Computer scientists in our midst here, you are the people of zero one. You understand all of this so, so well. And that's the world of the mind at work. You send your mind down into hell and it takes in the deep reality. Oh my God, this is a terrible place for the soul to be. Second deep reality, oh my God, I must not be there. Oh my God. May none of my people back home, may none of my relatives ever find this place. And we have one of the great, great biblical parables of Lazarus to remind us of this very truth. 
And so it is that St. Siloam, in his early monastic life, a Russian gone to Mount Athos, to the Russian monastery of Mount Athos, with very many monks there at the time. It was a, it was a going concern, shall we say, full house. And in the midst of all of this, he had the beginning of his spiritual vision. He sees Jesus Christ, which in the spiritual life is extremely dangerous. That's a very, very dicey thing to come and report that you've seen Jesus. Every time in America that that happens, that leads to a religious distortion of the first order. Joseph Smith, Palmyra, New York, 1830, in a meadow, sees Jesus Christ. Oh, not just Jesus, God the Father also. And that will lead to a great American version of religion. Great, I'm afraid to say, not in praise of great, but great in terms of distortion. Why is this not a problem for St. Siloam? Because he's in a monastery. He's in a controlled environment. He's in an environment that is completely saturated and in touch with the tradition of the church. He's protected. Such a vision can come to him, and it will not distort him, nor his brothers around him. Because for so long, his brethren didn't even know that it had happened. And in the vision, he's told, send your mind into hell and don't despair. And with that, he will work for many years in the mill house of that monastery, carrying very heavy bags of grain. There's even an icon. It's on our church webpage, and I invite our, our visitors and guests to go take a look at it. It's a very nice icon showing him in a slight profile, modern kind of icon, with a big old bag on his back, and he's turning and looking at you, and you can see his face. You can see the illuminated face already there. The bags of grain, they were about 50 pounds each. You know that became for him his cross. That became his symbolic cross. He was doing his appointed labor, working it out, working out his salvation, praying for souls, taking the burden of so many other souls on his shoulders in the form of those heavy bags. And through years of this and years of obedience, he became what would be known as a God-seer, a wonder worker. And though he was of no education, not much to speak of, he's known as an illuminated elder of the church, so much so that in 1930, a rather well-educated man from Moscow will come to the monastery and he will meet him and he will place himself under. This well-educated man goes underneath the uneducated man and that will lead to a lifetime relationship in the name of the Lord. The man will be known as Sophroni. He will become Sophroni, the elder of Essex in Great Britain. And he will write a definitive work on his elder the life of St. Siloam. It's quite a big tome, and because I've had a transformation towards St. Siloam, I've spoken with a few of my own, my own spiritual children and said, you know, I've always put that book away. And that, by the way, is a fourth apology here today. I would like to read it, but I'd want to read it with someone else to make sure I get done and I finish it, you know, spiritual book club. And so I'm working towards that. And in writing that book, we learn the stories that I'm telling you today because they were hidden from us. In the course of writing that book, the then, not yet Saint Sophroni, will then gather to himself all of the spiritual power of his elder and will bring it out of Athos and bring it to England. He will bring it to the Western world. And today he is himself regarded as a saint. And so what you have now is the lineage of sanctity flowing down from one to the other. The elder handing down the full endowment of grace, asceticism to the disciples. Now, an even bigger problem for us, but it's a good problem. That handing down of the endowment, that handing down of the grace actually has a parochial form. That's here. That's what we're doing. We're actually in our own way. It's a lighter form, but some people here in this, in this temple are rather ascetic. We have a problem in this beautiful temple. We have so many people repenting, we can't keep up with all the confessions. 
There are four of us, and when one of us is away, as is happening this, this Sunday, we feel it. We priests feel it. I, I know you feel it, too, because sometimes you're not able to make your sacramental confession. Some of us have been sick lately, and so we, we carry this, that we're, we're holding you up. I mentioned this to a priest at Jordanville on the telephone, and he said, do you realize how many people would be over rejoicing, exceedingly rejoicing to say they have this problem in their church? There are churches where no one repents. I know clergy who say no one has come, no one has confessed in six months, and only because it was a severe emergency, such as, you know, a diagnosis from the doctor or an automobile accident. And then I know some clergy that have forgotten the formula for confession. They have to go and run to find the book because they haven't done it in so long. They have to go and find the book to get the prayers out so they can say the correct prayers. We don't have that problem here at St. John's. We've actually had to cut some of the prayers down. We had to attenuate the ritual a little bit to accommodate the repentance that is going on here. That's a good story. Because that's a type of endowment through the asceticism of the church. It's a type of parochial eldership coming here for us. There are more. I won't keep you this morning with all of these stories. There are more. I just want to enliven you, wake you up a little bit, and ask you if you've neglected some saints, or if you judge somebody too hard, it's a good day to apologize. A rainy day is a good day to say, St. Siloam, I'm sorry. Take me back now. Today's a good day to say to a beloved person, especially if you have a domestic relationship called marriage or parenthood, children. It's a good day to say, honey, I love you. It's a beautiful day to say, honey, I love you. It's a beautiful day to do these things. Why? Because as St. Paul tells us, we are crucified by the world. St. Paul has let it be known to us what's happening. If you will allow me to go back just one week, because I cannot resist to return to this scripture from last week, because it pulls together everything from this week. The church is actually covering 2 Corinthians at this time of the year, and it bears out wonderful, wonderful texts. And this text is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10, 11, and 12. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that in the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live always deliver to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, Paul, but life is working in you. This is a farewell address, and what he's making very clear is, we've been been persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're hard-pressed, but we're not crushed. We've been beaten, but we are not destroyed. We have, in this earthen vessel, this flesh, we have excellence of the power of God. And he says that to his believers, his brothers and sisters, his spiritual children. You have it also. And so in this flesh that we have with Jesus Christ, the dying of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's where this endowment of grace is resting. It rests on us as we're standing, sometimes suffering, as we're praying, sometimes suffering, as we're begging God to help other people who are really suffering. And finally, let's not forget A fifth apology is necessary, and I'd like you all to join me in it. We have to apologize and say, Lord, for all of the people that we failed to pray for, especially for all the people who have no one to pray for them. Think about it. Here in our capital city, let's just take our capital. How many people in this city don't pray at all? I spoke to one young person recently. We were having a meeting, so I had to ask, are you religious? And he said, no. I said, do you ever pray? Because sometimes people can say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. So I thought, well, uh, do you ever pray? He goes, no, I don't pray. I said, well, joking, I said, well, those avenues now are gone. We'll have to find another way to get to the solution. But as we left, and we left on good terms, 
I worried about him. And I began to imagine a life with no prayer, a life with no faith, none. That man needs prayer. And there are so many, other like, so many others like him. Whenever you light a candle, whenever you have a moment, you can say, and for those who are in most need of your mercy and help, Lord, save them. That would be a tremendously beautiful Silouanic act to do, to carry them on your shoulders like the sacks of grain, to take them with you as you send your heart into heaven. But of course, as we know, we must send our mind into hell and pray for our salvation. God have mercy on us.